join us today. Um, we've got a great program for you. Uh, my co-host today is Jill Scheidt, who is our field specialist in livestock or in agronomy at Barton County. I'm a field specialist in agronomy in Stone County. And um, so we've got a, a great program for you. And I just want to um, encourage you to ask questions uh, of the pre presenters today. And so we will be glad to uh, address any questions that you have by um, sending them on the chat. Um, you can send it to ask questions here in the chat, which is actually Jill Scheidt and she will uh, get them directed to us at the appropriate time. So um, that's the best way to do it. You're welcome also to send questions to uh, the entire group if you prefer to do that. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a, a, a great agenda here today um, with uh, the weather forecast with Dr. Pat Ganan, our state extension climatologist, and then Jill Scheidt will also provide us a fall armyworm update. Uh, and then uh, following Jill's update, we will have a discussion with Matt Herring on late summer soil fertility management for, for forages. Pat, are you ready to roll? I am, thank you, Tim. And good afternoon, everyone. I'll um, get right into the presentation. Well, we just have a few more days left in July, and uh, I think we're going to go out with a bang, especially with the forecast over the next few days as we go into the weekend. But looking uh, back at some of the precipitation just over the past week since we last met, there was some scattered showers and thunderstorms that fired up across the state over the weekend. Most areas actually missed out or didn't receive much, but there were a few locations that did see, receive some significant rainfall. The radar image here on the left shows in the greens and um, darker greens, that's where the heaviest rain fell. And you could see the scattered nature of that. There was some big rains across the St. Louis area, parts of Northeast, just west of Boone County here in Cooper and parts of uh, Sheridan County. They got some decent rainfall in Southwest and Southeast. And these are the totals, actual rain gauge reports. You can see just south of St. Louis, three and a half inches near uh, in Jefferson County and just south of Fenton, Missouri. And, some bigger totals in around Poplar Bluff and West Central around Butler and Bates County over two and a half inches. But again, that was the exception. I think most people actually missed out than received any notable precip, at least over the past week. On the right, this is the amount of radar estimates for the month. That'll take us July 1st up through this morning. Uh, anything in those greens and yellows, it's below normal, uh, generally less than three inches and less than two inches. Uh, and even less than an inch and a half in a few locations here in Northwest, West Central Missouri, and some scattered areas here in Southeast Missouri, uh, and in parts of Southwest Missouri, some counties that have actually been running below normal for the month. Some of the highest and lowest totals I could find uh, for rain gauge reports for the month so far, St. Genevieve County. Actually, they were somewhat dry in June, but they got the rains in July, over 10 inches. Here in St. Genevieve County, this magenta color showing the heaviest rain concentration. St. Francis County around just outside of Farmington, almost 10 inches of rain. And then those northwestern areas and parts of west central Missouri, these were the lowest totals. Andrew, Clinton, and Buchanan County, generally less than about, about an inch and a half for the month. Nonetheless, I think it's, we're looking pretty good moisture-wise, at least the subsoil. We got all that rain from mid-June through mid-July, that really kept the soil profile quite moist. Uh, maybe a little bit of drier topsoil conditions, but I think the forecast over the next few days might allevi alleviate any of that topsoil dryness with rain chances. I think the big story for today and into tomorrow and perhaps even across Southern Missouri for Saturday are the, is the heat and the humidity. We have some really high heat indices that are forecast today, tomorrow, and even into Saturday for parts of Southern Missouri. Here in the upper left, these are heat advisories that have been uh, posted across much of the central US from Missouri south to Louisiana and east to Georgia. All of Missouri is in, in some form of heat advisory, even southwestern sections where those heat indices could be approaching 110 degrees today. Uh, they have an excessive heat warning. That heat advisory is in effect until 9 p.m. this evening across the northern half of Missouri. 
and until 9 p.m. Friday across the southern half. And I wouldn't be surprised to see that extended into parts of Saturday, especially across south central and southwestern Missouri for those uh, high humidities and high temperatures that can be quite uncomfortable if you're outside for an extended period of time. Of course, be aware of that. Drink plenty of water, stay hydrated, wear loose fit, light colored clothing, and try to spend as much time in the shade or, or uh, have an opportunity to get in some air conditioning for a little bit if you have to be outside. On the, over the next three days, these are the maximum temperature forecast today. Hot, again, look at these mid to upper 90s across much of the state. These are some of the hottest temperatures we've seen since the middle part of June. Friday, uh, it's interesting to know, look at this little wedge of cooler conditions. That is a cold front currently residing across from, that extends from Iowa into Nebraska that will be slowly moving southward over the next few days and it, it will be through northeastern Missouri. Look at those high temperatures tomorrow, only in the low 80s versus still in the mid to upper 90s across southwestern parts of the state. And even into Saturday, highs in the upper 70s in northeast Missouri, but still in the lower to mid 90s in southwest Missouri. Of course, when you have a cold front like that with 20 degree temperature differentials at the end of July, uh, there are gonna be some fireworks in regard to showers and thunderstorms. That will be the battle zone over the next few days, right over Missouri, bringing some pretty good chances of some notable and perhaps widespread precipitation for the state. Uh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna forget about these heat indices. Again, these last three map, th these maps here at the bottom showing Look at that triple digit heat. When you combine the heat and humidity, you get some high apparent temp temperatures and into the well into the hundreds statewide today. Of course, uh, that will persist across south central and southwestern parts of the state for tomorrow and perhaps even into Saturday. But it, cooler, much and less humid conditions are on the way. Just hang in, the, hang in there across southern Missouri. It looks like Sunday statewide, things will be much cooler as well as uh, humidities will be lower. Too. But in the meantime, as that front makes its way southward through the state, uh, best rainfall chances across northern Missouri. They're, they're forecasting some storms to fire up uh, later this afternoon, mid, mid to late afternoon across north central, northeastern parts of the state. Those will, generally, will slowly translate their way south and southeastward. Uh, there could be some severe weather across northeast Missouri. That's this map here in the lower left. That area shaded in yellow has the highest likelihood of severe weather here in northeast quarter of the state for Missouri for later this afternoon and early this evening. Uh, also, I want to pay attention on the right here with that frontal boundary hanging up across our state over the next few days. Uh, starting tonight, there could, with those thunderstorms developing across northern Missouri, and that they're going to be slow moving and they could be uh, reorganizing and regenerating and kind of training, a process they call training, and that could potentially bring some excessive rainfall across north, central, and northeastern parts of the state. Another round of storms are forecast to fire up uh, late tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow night. That could again impact northern parts of Missouri. It looks like by Saturday, mor Saturday uh, morning into Sunday morning, uh, much of Missouri, there is a marginal threat for some excessive rainfall. So it does look like the chances over the next three days for Missouri, uh, any part of Missouri to receive some significant rainfall. That's depicted here over the next uh, five days. But I would say generally from starting this afternoon across northern Missouri and across the rest of the state as we go into Friday, Saturday and early Sunday morning. Again, this is a generalized map. Some areas will receive more, some will receive less, but generally one to two inches of precipitation across the entire state of Missouri with that cold front hanging up over their state and actually being stationary for a few days. That will bring us these better chances of rainfall, many chances of rainfall as we, it won't be a total rain out, but there will be occasional chances, again, starting late this afternoon across Northern Missouri and then translating southward as we go into uh, later in the day on Friday, Saturday and early Sunday morning. That being said, as we go into Sunday, they, they are forecasting that front to exit the state and move south of us. That will bring ushering cooler weather conditions across all of Missouri, as well as less humid conditions. And this is a forecast for next week. There is actually an enhanced likelihood of those temperatures being below normal. That's a good thing for the first week of August here in Missouri. 
That would place highs generally in the lower to middle 80s for much of next week. Uh, of course, with those drier um, dew points, lower dew points, lower humidities, there won't be much chance for any notable or significant rainfall. Along with this pleasant weather, I think we'll see plenty of sunshine next week. They are forecasting a return to more drier conditions uh, for much of next week. But for at least for now, over the next couple of days, the, the heat and humidity are here to stay, as well as increasing chances of showers and thunderstorms on into the weekend. Tim, that's pretty much a weather report. Thank you so much. I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Pat. Um, we certainly would welcome a, um, a cool front moving in and, and a little bit of moderate rainfall, certainly in late July going into early August. So thank you very much. Okay, let me get my uh, PowerPoint back up and there's Jill Scheidt, and she's all set, and looks like uh, she's going to be talking about fall armyworms in pastures and hayfields. I know there's been a few reports in southern Missouri, and this time of year we do we do want to keep our eyes open. So, Jill, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Tim. Yes, let's go ahead and get started. It is the time of year to kind of scout for our fall armyworms in pastures and hayfields. And as Tim said, um, there are some reports of fall armyworm coming in from southeast Missouri and Arkansas. No reports that we've heard of in southwest Missouri yet. Okay, so let's talk about ID first. Fall armyworm are migratory insects with multiple generations. To ensure a positive ID, first you wanna look for four prolegs in the middle of the body. And here in this picture, you can see about three of those prolegs there, but they're just right here in the middle of the body. You wanna look for those. And then you may need a hand lens to find the four spots on the end of the larvae, and then look at the head really closely for an inverted Y shape. Fall armyworm have a wide range of host plants and as you can see in this picture this is where they get their name. They can literally march like an army from one pasture to the next and cause significant damage overnight. The later instars do tend to feed more so it is important to scout often. This means that every couple days you need to be scouting, and when you begin to see them, I'd even go ahead and start just scouting every day. Now let's go over how to find them. You're gonna look in about 10 random spots in your pasture or hay field, and I tend to look at lush fields first, and then if you also see a lot of bird activity going on, look in those fields too. It's best to scout early in the morning or evening, but not during the heat of the day. Armyworms will not be active during the heat of the day, therefore they are harder to find. I like to grab the grass in both my hands and beat it together really hard so the insects fall to the ground and are easier to find. Then I examine the grass around just looking for some feeding and frass and you can see um, armyworm frass here in this picture by Wayne Bailey. And then you want to move the grass and any debris and look for the larvae on the ground, like kind of look around on the soil for them. And you can make a one square foot, um, you know, square if you like to help you count, or you can just measure with your hands. My hands happen to be about six inches long, so I just measure a spot with them. And if you find three or more half inch larvae per square foot, you're at threshold and should utilize a control method. And if you're close to harvest, just go ahead and harvest early. And there are many insecticides labeled for armyworm control in pasture and hay field. You wanna target those half inch to one inch long larvae. Any smaller larvae may be controlled by natural predators. And then larger larvae will soon pupate and no longer be a threat. And recently in Arkansas and Louisiana, pyrethroid resistance has been observed. So to combat this, you wanna use multiple modes of action or alternative chemistries. And of course you wanna read the label to determine that mode of action of the pesticide. And just to kind of help us think about what pyrethroids are, they're categor categorized as a group 3A insecticide and the active ingredient name usually ends with 
Thrin. The graphic below is from MU Extension agronomist Sarah Kenyon and MU State entomologist Kevin Rice. But if you want more information on specific insecticide options for fall armyworm control, please contact your local MU Extension agronomy specialist. And Tim, uh, with that, that's all I have, and I'm ready for questions if we have time. Yes, thank you, Jill. Uh, great overview. Do we have any questions that have come up? I don't see any in the chat yet. I haven't either, but uh, it's timely information, and uh, I know um, it's we're we're back at this point to uh, to to be looking for them uh, because you never know when they're going to pop up. It's hard to predict. If there aren't any other questions, we will move forward uh, with our next presentation, and that is with Matt Herring. He's a field specialist in agronomy based in Franklin County, Union, Missouri. Um, Matt's going to cover late summer soil fertility management of forages. So, Matt, I'm gonna, if you want to share your screen, we'll let you go ahead. Looks good. Thanks, Tim. Um, so uh, today I'll be talking about late summer uh, soil fertility management in forages. Uh, I think a lot of folks uh, think about uh, soil fertility early in the season, uh, but there really are a lot of opportunities for uh, evaluating opportunities for um, fertility in late summer and into the fall. Uh, so today we'll just think about our goals when we're producing forage. Um, your, your goals may vary, but I think most would agree with these three goals to provide a, a quality forage for our livestock uh, and then provide a consistent forage quantity. And by consistent, I mean something that is there um, throughout a growing season um, on a regular basis. And then the third goal there is to provide that forage economically. And so as we think about economics, um, we often talk about hay production being an expensive way to provide forage. Today, we'll be talking about some options to reduce that forage cost as we move into uh, in, as we move into the fall and winter. Some topics I want to talk about today include soil testing, uh, stockpiling tall fescue, uh, phosphorus and potassium management, uh, pH management through uh, liming, uh, how we might incorporate legumes if we haven't already. And finally, to think about options uh, that may be available to provide nutrients, uh, including manure and poultry litter applications. I always like to start with soil testing. I think that's really the foundation of uh, making good decisions for soil fertility uh, uh, applications. Um, I think the first thing to remember is that soils are variable. I always say that uh, uh, no two soils are exactly alike, just like no two people are alike, and we have to recognize that variability. And that variability can come from a variety of, uh, of, of reasons. And the picture there on my slide shows some of the reasons that we might find uh, soils to be different in terms of soil fertility. Um, you can see there we have two different soil types, uh, soil type A and soil type B. Uh, we have an area of the farm that has been uh, had manure applications historically. And it's important to recognize, even though we may not have uh, lives of manure being produced on the farm today, we may need to talk to our parents, grandparents, et cetera, and find out if there was manure applied in the past, maybe going back as far as 50 or even 75 years, making a difference in what we're seeing today. Uh, you can see lime dust drifting in from the gravel road that we probably would wanna stay away from. And you can also see there where we had an old fence that we took out and, and uh, uh, took two fields and made one. Uh, those could all be reasons why uh, soils are different and why we need to think about sampling our, uh, our areas of our, of our fields separately. And I mentioned there that we want to take lots of cores to represent one area or one field. Um, generally, a, a sample might not uh, uh, represent more than 20 acres. Um, the more cores that you take you know, from the surface down to about six or seven inches to composite, mix and, and make a sample, the better. I always tell people minimum would be eight to 10, more is better though. Uh, soil testing that's arguably one of the greatest, uh, provides one of the greatest returns on investment. 
It provides you information for you to make management decisions. I always tell people that you don't have to follow what we give you on your report exactly, but what you have there is information for you to make that decision, uh, an informed decision. Uh, nitrogen uh, for tall fescue uh, is, uh, you can see the growth curve here for uh, cool season grass, and this is, this is primarily looking at fescue. Um, and that, that black line there is, is what we are going to arbitrarily draw for our, our forage demand by our livestock. Um, and the growth curve in the spring is always quite generous and uh, uh, provides lots of forage. And then we struggle through the summer generally. Um, but then uh, fescue will also grow again in the fall. And that's uh, Will McLean talked about uh, stockpiling tall fescue last week. And so I won't dwell on it too long, but just as a reminder, uh, that applying nitrogen in early to mid-August uh, helps to increase and extend our fall forage. Um, it may not be as responsive as, uh, as our nitrogen applications that we make in the spring, but when we think about the forage that is produced, we make no seed heads and arguably has a, a lot of value as we move into fall and winter. So as we stockpile tall fescue, we, again, we're gonna think about applying nitrogen in early to mid-August. Um, if you uh, have a toxic endophyte infected tall fescue, the recommendation would be to not apply mo any more than 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, if you have established novel endophyte infected fescue, we would encourage you to apply up to 80 pounds if, if you, uh, nitrogen per acre, if that's uh, a goal that you have. Um, so that, those are the general uh, uh, recommendations for stockpiling tall fescue. Uh, some will ask about uh, nitrogen impact on legumes, and uh, this graph is some work that was done by uh, some of our faculty at the uh, University of Missouri in, uh, a few years ago, and the numbers on the bottom represent nitrogen uh, applied in the fall, uh, let's say in August, uh, per, and these numbers are kilograms per hectare, and you can turn those into pounds per acre by multiplying them by 0.89. Uh, so 56 pounds is equivalent to 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 112 pounds, uh, or I'm sorry, 112 kilograms per hectare would be 100 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre. And what this is showing is that it does have some impact on legumes. Uh, generally, we're probably not applying a whole lot more than that, uh, that first notch, maybe a little above that. Uh, so it will uh, affect uh, legumes some. Um, the the year, uh, year two there was a big legume year, and it seemed to have a greater impact on that, uh, that, that year than it did on those years where we had less legume. Uh, if we think about nitrogen sources for stockpiling, uh, my uh, our soil fertility faculty would suggest not using coated urea because of the slow release that can happen with that, that uh, uh, product. Generally looking at using ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, or urea with agrotane generally are all about equal. Uh, agrotane contains uh, a, a NBPT that's now off patent, and so you're gonna find, maybe you'll find some generics out there that will also be effective. There are some other products out there that uh, don't contain NBPT and probably are not gonna give you um, the, uh, the uh, impact that uh, agrotane does at, at uh, uh, keeping those losses from urea, nitrogen losses from urea from happening. We do see uh, sometimes people wanting to apply uh, some products, uh, foliar or low rate products. So there's some real questions about uh, how effective those products may be. My theory is, is a pound of nitrogen is a pound of nitrogen, and we need to keep with that as we make our decisions uh, in, in terms of stockpiling tall fescue. Now let's, uh, let's uh, turn our attention now to phosphorus and potassium applications in the fall. Uh, phosphorus and potassium are, are, are both important for forage production, uh, and really the, the need is revealed through soil testing. Uh, we really do remove a lot of, of phosphorus and especially potassium in hay. I've got some numbers in the next slide that will show that. Um, and what we find is that, unfortunately, a lot of uh, uh, fields have relatively low soil test levels. And if anything, I think especially potassium levels have uh, been lower, much lower in the last 10 years than they were before that. So this is a, a table to show um, phosphorus and potassium removal from different crops. You start with 150 bushels of corn, uh, three tons of fescue hay, and finally three tons of fescue pasture. And it's interesting that with the fescue hay, it's similar phosphorus removal as 150 bushels of corn, but look at how much more potassium is being removed with uh, three tons of fescue hay compared to 150 bushels of corn. 
contrast that again with the pesky pasture and how little really is removed uh, when we have livestock grazing in our fields. So just know that when we're removing hay, we're removing a lot of nutrients. And if those nutrients are not replaced, uh, we'll see uh, forged uh, yields go down, forage stands decrease, increase weed, weeds in, in our fields. And so uh, those are, are all factors to consider as we make our, our uh, hay harvests and, and how we manage nutrients relative to that. A couple of studies I wanted to share with you. One looking at phosphorus, this is a greenhouse experiment in New Zealand uh, just a few years ago, evaluating phosphorus and lime applications on a variety of legumes that they grow there. And what was interesting is that it really phosphorus helped to increase yields of all the legumes they studied. And they looked at both annuals and perennials. Uh, some work done actually in the 50s and, and, uh, and uh, the, published in the 60s was looking at uh, tall fescue and ladino clover mixes. And it was interesting that potassium fertilizer in this case increased clover yields over 300%. Um, so suffice it to say phosphorus and potassium are important for our our legumes, and I think everybody would, would agree that legumes are, are valuable for our forage mix. So they do help to increase clover in the stand, higher, and of course clovers or are, are, are legumes are higher quality uh, for our, our animals and resulting in better gains. Uh, phosphorus and potassium can also help to discourage beef edge, arguably a lower quality forage. It's also important to recognize it's important to correct our soil pH uh, using lime if needed uh, to encourage our clover and help to discourage green sedge. Uh, I mentioned pH management and I maybe we turn our attention now to uh, pH management a little bit. pH is simply a measure of hydrogen ion activity in whatever we're measuring it in. Um, it, uh, pH plays a big role in aluminum, aluminum solubility and aluminum is toxic to most of the plants that we grow. And so we're trying to uh, keep aluminum uh, from moving into a solution. And that's where if we keep it in uh, pH is in that six, uh, around six, uh, five, five, and maybe six, five, generally we're going to minimize the potential for aluminum toxicity. Uh, lower pH can also impact nutrient availability. So phosphorus, potassium, and other nutrients the plants need are less available at very low pHs. So here's the desired soil, uh, soil pHs for uh, a number of our legumes that we grow and also for grasses. You can see generally grasses can uh, do all right with a lower pH than, than our legumes. Uh, we'll talk about lime for just a minute. Lime is uh, generally calcium carbonate, maybe magnesium carbonate, uh, but it's uh, what we use it for is to raise soil pH uh, and it helps to make uh, nutrients more available. I always like to throw in here that it's not magic because sometimes it seems we uh, want to talk about other ways that, that we use lime um, that I, I don't think are accurate. Uh, and just remember that we sell lime in Missouri uh, uh, based on its, uh, it has to have a, uh, has to be tested and that uh, testing results in effective neutralizing material value that generally is between 300 and 800. Um, I encourage people to buy lime by the units of EM um, and recommend that you apply according to soil test reports. Uh, I always tell people don't apply lime until you have a soil test report that tells you that you need to put on lime. Uh, right? Remember that legumes need a higher soil pH than grasses generally. Uh, you can apply lime anytime. Uh, oftentimes that's uh, more of a factor of when can your lime hauler get to it. Summer is oftentimes a good time to do that, maybe in the fall. Uh, I always tell people that if we need to put on lime, we want to spend our first dollars on lime and, and then move on to the other nutrients, but only put on lime if you need it. My final point there is uh, generally to avoid pelleted lime because it's very expensive uh, per unit of EM. And uh, pelletized lime or pelleted lime is simply pretty good ag lime that's been pressed into a pellet. Uh, just some, and being in a pellet or being in a bag doesn't make it any more effective than. In the same E and M lime that's uh, in a powder form that we sell as ag lime. Uh, spend a minute just talking about the legumes and the importance of legumes. They uh, certainly do improve forage quality. Uh, they have a neat relationship with a bacteria that we call rhizobia that uh, fixes uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere. And I've often thought that, that was uh, maybe the eighth wonder of the world. Um, and finally, uh, legumes help to dilute the toxic endophyte uh, infected fescue that we have in Missouri. And so if we haven't converted over to novel endophyte fescue, legumes are a great way to at least dilute that uh, toxic endophyte fungus. 
Um, talk about manure and, and uh, uh, poultry litter, litter for just a few minutes. Uh, I always say that plants really don't care where nutrients come from. It's just that they need those nutrients uh, when, they're, when they need them. And arguably manure and, and poultry litter can be a great source of nutrients. Uh, we have to remember that hauling distance can be a significant factor. Um, and arguably we need to probably do some testing on that manure or poultry litter so that we know what we have. It can be quite variable. And to try to use book values may not be very accurate in terms of what we're actually getting and making good decisions about our application rates. These are, uh, this is a, this a table looking at some uh, um, application rates of poultry litter uh, in tons per acre uh, on fescue or a fescue clover mix and also on Bermuda grass. And this is four years worth of work and three reps at the University of Arkansas. And you can see the, the dry matter of, uh, of, of each forage that was produced. And in each case, uh, the addition of litter increased yields, but it's interesting that the either fescue or Bermuda without clover mixed in uh, produced more yield response than did um, the fescue and clover. And what's really interesting is you think about fescue and clover uh, started out at a much higher point without any uh, litter additions. And so um, just, just I think that might help guide you as to where we want to use that uh, poultry litter uh, and just know that it's a, it's a great source of nutrients. And uh, if you have it available to you, uh, or if you have other manure available to you, certainly uh, uh, evaluate it for its uh, potential for replacing other nutrients that you might apply. So as we think about, as we wrap up this presentation, soil fertility in the fall can involve a number of steps. And I always tell people soil testing is where we need to start. Um, uh, people sometimes ask, when should you soil test? And I tell people we should soil test on, when, first of all, when you have time to do a good job. And also I'd like for you to do it when the soil is uh, accommodating. If, uh, if the soil is too hard as it might be getting with these high temperatures, we might wanna wait until we get a little bit of rain to uh, make it a little easier to pull soil out of the ground. Uh, today, we also talked about stock, stockpiling called fescue and we're getting very close to the time when you're gonna to want to do that. Uh, we want to remember about phosphorus, the importance of phosphorus and potassium management. <clears throat> and uh, phosphorus and potassium can be applied any time in the year. Um, and we just need to work at building up those soil test levels over time. pH management, we talked about that and miming and its importance in soil fertility. Uh, we also talked about the importance of legumes and, and how they improve forage quality. And finally, uh, how we can use manure and poultry litter uh, to improve, uh, to, to, to add to our soil fertility plan. I'm Matt Herring, I'm a field specialist in agronomy. I'm in Union, that's my phone number, that's my email address. Uh, I welcome any calls after this presentation if you have questions, but we certainly would be glad to take some questions now. So Jill or Tim. Thank you, Matt. That's a great presentation. Great overview of some things we need to think about regarding fertility in our pastures and hay fields. Um, I have to say, uh, uh, as an agronomist, your your comment about the rhizobial bacteria being, you know, fixation of nitrogen uh, is the eighth wonder of the world. I tend to agree with that. That's an amazing feat, <laughs> an amazing thing that occurs. And so, uh, Jill, do we have any questions? Yes, we have a couple questions coming in on the chat. Um, first one, Matt, is um, how does phosphate and potash applications get picked up from forage crops? And what is better, spring application or fall application of our phosphate and potash? Phosphate and potash can be applied at any time. And I always tell people we wanna to try to allow our soil tests uh, soil testing reports to guide us in making those decisions about how much to apply. Usually we're talking about annual applications. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to put on some in the spring and the fall, that's okay, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, the timing is not as critical. Uh, those nutrients are taken up through the roots. Uh, they're not particularly mobile. Uh, and that, that's why it, it takes a little bit of time to work down into the soil. And so uh, it may take a little while for those plants to actually see those nutrients. Uh, but it's important that we get them on um, and just know that we've got a lot of soils out there that are pretty low in both. Thanks, Matt. Uh, shifting a little bit to nitrogen now. Uh, question is, is it worth applying nitrogen to fields 
that may have some fescue, but have a higher percentage of other cool season grasses. And, and, and Jill, just so I'm clear, are you talking about stockpiling? Um, it does not, um, it doesn't specify here what, which, you know, stockpiling or not, but um, I think mainly asking about just nitrogen in general okay. and well, maybe, other cool season grasses. And, oh, they did specify it is stockpiling. Good question. And, and we uh, generally focus on fescue for our stockpiling largely because of the fescue plant um, is, it does a better job of, of surviving into the fall and winter. Uh, it has a waxy coating on its uh, leaf. And um, what we find is other plants, first of all, probably don't respond to nitrogen as well as fescue. And secondly, I, I don't think that they survive um, our, our, our weather as we try to move into winter, into January or February. I think those plants fall apart a lot quicker. Uh, and so probably if I was going to uh, prioritize where I, I stockpiled, uh, I, would, I would look at my stands that are mostly fescue. Thanks, Matt. I got one last question here. Um, the question asks uh, if fall nitrogen will, adding nitrogen in the fall, will it reduce legumes or if we're wanting to kind of keep our legumes a little bit more, is fall or spring hurt them more or less? I think uh, certainly spring applications of nitrogen uh, have been shown to significantly reduce uh, legume stands. Um, and the, the one slide I showed, I probably didn't spend as much time on as I should have, uh, but that was fall nitrogen applications. And, and that was showing some reduction in legume stands the following season. I think that the data was from June, if I, if I remember correctly. And so just know that, that stockpiling tall fescue will probably have an impact on your legumes. And so we probably just have to weigh that benefit of that stockpiling versus uh, the loss of some legumes. And maybe it just shows that we have to go back in and, and establish some additional legumes, um, you know, maybe in February or, or, or even into the spring, potentially, if, if that gets to be an issue. Thanks, Matt. Uh, for right now, that's all the questions we have in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Matt. And um, we're going to move forward uh, with a discussion about the YouTube channel. You can find this uh, program on YouTube uh, on by watching uh, the recordings, uh, as well as many others that have been done throughout the past year or so. So I encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel at MUIPM, and uh, they will pop up uh, more frequently for you and make you available, make these new ones available as they come online. So I encourage you to review some of those as we, as you get into YouTube from time to time. Uh, lots of great information. Uh, it's very, very impressed with some of the, the quality uh, speakers and the uh, topics that, that have been done over the past year. Also, uh, just to give you an update about the upcoming town halls, we do have a full schedule uh, going through August on a weekly basis. You can see some of the topics that will be, will be covered. Uh, and then as we get into September, we're going to go to a monthly basis starting on September the 9th. So you'll hear more about that as we go. But uh, right now for August, the, uh, the next town hall will be August the 5th next week at noon with Dr. John Jennings of the University of Arkansas covering cool season forage variety and establishments, the varieties and establishment. And uh, that's certainly gonna be timely as uh, we're getting into that season of, of establishing cool season grasses. So for now, I wanna thank you for being with us today. Hope you have a great rest of your week.